So my boldest claim would be to abolish copyright protection altogether. It's a complete hypothetical thought experiment. I know it wouldn't happen, and I don't really wish that it would happen, because then I would be out of a job. But if you did abolish copyright law, the world would not end. The character of artistic culture that copyright currently supports would change. We would still have artistic culture, but we would have different kinds of artistic culture. We would have different kinds of film, different kinds of television, different kinds of radio, different kinds of music, painting, sculpture, photography, dance, software. Things today that need broad copyright protection to be produced and distributed might continue to be produced and distributed because of market structures, social norms, fan cultures, cult support from amateurs and so forth might continue to support a lot of what we have today even without copyright protection. And some things might disappear. And in their place, other things would emerge that do not require copyright for their, for their production or distribution. And so the reason to keep copyright is not that there is some eternal justification for copyright, but that there is some implicit underlying judgment as a matter of public policy that we prefer the landscape of culture and business associated with culture that we have today over the hypothetical unknown alternative that would emerge in the absence of copyright. In terms of changes in the law, perhaps? Well, in the, in the US, which is what I know the best, uh, there will be continued efforts to increase the power of copyright protection and IP protection generally on behalf of current incumbent IP owners. So the proposed legislation that failed in Congress last spring, the Stop Online Piracy Act, SOPA and PIPA, I don't recall the, the name of PIPA, but I remember the acronym, versions of that legislation will come back. Preparations to reintroduce that legislation are already underway some flavor of that legislation will be enacted at the national level. And the US will continue its efforts to try to export those models through bilateral and multilateral negotiations as forms of trade law to developing countries, which is underway today, and then eventually to more developed countries. So Europe has been very resistant to ACTA and to equivalent kinds of things. But eventually, I think the United States tactics will be to go to smaller countries in Southeast Asia, the Asia Pacific Rim, Africa, parts of South America, and through bilateral and multilateral negotiations, try to get those countries to adopt the US model. And then the US will go back to Europe and say, get on board because everybody else is already on that same page. So I think that it's not good news for people who are advocates of balance and consumer power and uh, access to knowledge and access to creativity in the less developed countries. The, all, of the, all of the signs are lining up against them. Uh, there is the development agenda that's uh, underway at WIPO right now, so that there are efforts to lobby for stronger protection for access to justice in the context of international IP lawmaking, but the efforts at WIPO and the efforts by the United States and the multilateral treaty negotiations seem to be operating somewhat independently of each other. And so it's hard to predict exactly how that's all going to shake out at the end of the day. Well, let me point to two things. One is, I have quite a number of my former students who are now successful practicing lawyers in intellectual property in Pittsburgh, in New York, in Washington, D.C., in San Diego, in Texas, in Chicago, all over the country, and even a couple of people outside of the United States. And they remember who I am, and they keep me apprised of what they're doing, and they occasionally ask me for my views or advice about things that they're doing. And that's always a source of, of uh, great pride just because you want to see your, your students succeed. Uh, that doesn't mean that I agree with everything that they're doing on behalf of their clients. It simply means that I have motivated them to some small degree to stay engaged in that field and to build a career in that field. Um, so that's one, I think, very important thing. And I think any teacher would take pride in the success of his or her former students. The other thing that I'm proud of is not so much directly to my students, but it's an outcome of my scholarship. 
which tends to be rather theoretical. And so any law professor sometimes gets, act, gets asked, you know, why do you spend so much time doing theoretical scholarship? How does that actually help change things in the world? And I've been very fortunate over the last six or seven years to be associated with a group of people who are taking my work on fair use in copyright law and building an institutional framework for real creators to use my theories of fair use to actually advance their efforts to produce creative things. Film, software, teaching materials, uh, curricula for high school students, a lot of different kinds of ways, museum collections uh, and so forth. So not all kinds of work by academic lawyers needs to result in results in uh, lawsuits. So oftentimes law professors say, you know, your work's not being cited by a court and it doesn't count. My work's not cited by courts. But my work does get used in day-to-day -day practice by people who are making movies, people who are building museum collections, people who are teaching, and that's actually enormously gratifying.